two things straight off the top. First, I'm going to drop a spoiler for the first season of Star Trek Picard in a minute, so if you want to avoid that, I suggest you just skip to the next section. Second, I know the subject of this video might rub some people the wrong way, so let me put it out there right now. I love Data. Everybody loves Data. He's one of the most beloved characters in the franchise, which is probably why the creators of Star Trek Picard decided to build their entire first season up to the scene where Data dies. Even though he already died almost 20 years ago in Star Trek Nemesis, which made that whole bit, beautifully written and acted though it was, seem weirdly anticlimactic. But that's not the point. The point is, Data's great. I'm not saying Data shouldn't have been on the show, or that he was a bad person, or anything else like that. I'm just asking the same sort of question that I often ask when I'm musing about the overlooked or perhaps unintentionally troubled aspects of a TV show or a movie, Star Trek in this case. The only difference is, instead of asking this question to myself as I sit slumped on the couch, alone in the early morning dark, semi-conscious, empty beer bottles scattered in a jagged half-circle around my feet like a fragment of the perimeter of some crude mandala marked out by a drunken yogi, I'm asking this question to you in this video. And that question, is Data actually too dangerous for Starfleet? Pretty much everyone agrees that Star Trek The Next Generation got off to a rough start. Creatively, it seemed to be pulling in two directions at once, simultaneously trying to recapture the tone and morality play of the weak format of Star Trek the original series, and chart its own unique course with a new and diverse cast of characters, most of whom had no direct analogs to the classic crew of the Enterprise. Sure, lots of people have pointed out that Riker seems to have a little Kirk in him, but the rest of the TNG cast can't be lined up with their predecessors nearly so easily. Who's the Picard on Classic Trek? Who's the Tasha? Who's the Worf? At first glance, it seems obvious that Data is meant to be TNG's answer to Spock, and in a way that does turn out to be the case, the two characters are superficially similar, they're the only ones of their kind on the ship, they're unemotional, and they're each the breakout character of their series, but if you look a little deeper, you see that Spock and Data have a lot less in common than at first appears. For example, as TOS goes on, we eventually learn that while Spock doesn't display emotions, usually, he does have them. He represses them, as most Vulcans do, through a form of mental discipline that empowers the logical mind over the passions. This means that Spock is constantly fighting his own emotions for control, subverting his natural tendencies for a calmer, colder state of mind that his culture has decided is superior. Data, on the other hand, is an android who, during the TV series anyway, is incapable of emotion. He behaves in a way that suggests empathy, but he doesn't actually feel empathy. He doesn't feel anything. But he doesn't need emotions to recognize that not having them sets him apart from everyone else. Feeling emotions is a realm of experience that Data knows he can't access, and that knowledge is the source of his greatest discontent. Whereas Spock views his emotions as a wild animal that must be caged, Data regards himself as incomplete without them. And this is despite the fact that Data isn't actually incomplete. As we learn in the first season episode Data Lore, Data's creator, Dr. Sung, was capable of building an android with emotions. With Data, he just chose not to. Data isn't missing his emotions. He was never intended to have them in the first place. They were never supposed to be a part of his programming. The fact that Data has programming, programming so complex even he doesn't fully understand it, programming which he frequently struggles to transcend, is one of the major reasons why, if Data were a real person rather than a character in a sci-fi adventure show, the question in the title of this video would be so necessary to ask, because throughout Star Trek The Next Generation, we find examples of times when Data's programming was co-opted by an outside force, or behaved in an unpredictable way, leading to some pretty serious problems for the rest of the crew of the Enterprise-D, and for Data himself. For one such example, 
let's talk about an episode from early on in TNG's fourth season titled Brothers. Tragedy has struck aboard the Starship Enterprise. I mean, kinda. There's this kid, Willie, and he's got a dangerous infection, so the ship has to head for the nearest starbase, which is about two days away. Willie's big brother, Jake, is in trouble because he played a prank on Willie that made Willie think he had killed Jake during a game of laser tag. So Willie panicked and ran away and hid, and while he was hiding, he ate some fruit filled with deadly parasites. And now poor Willie is quarantined and on death's door. And I have some questions. Why are there plants with deadly parasites on the Enterprise? And if there's some legitimate reason for them to be there, medical research, or maybe they're being transported to a botanical garden on some planet. Why are there plants with deadly parasites on the Enterprise where kids can get at them? Are there just poisonous plants in the Arboretum out in the open where anyone can get at them? Was that you, Keiko? I'm not trying to jump on you. I like you, Keiko. I'm not one of your weirdo haters, but what's with leaving the deadly plants out there for the kids to eat? <sighs> Feels like you might have dropped the ball a little here. Speaking of kids eating deadly plants, that's my second question. Willie thinks he's killed his brother, runs off and hides, and just, what, eats the first thing he finds hanging on a tree? Why? Was he hungry? If he was hungry, he lives on a spaceship where every room has a magic hole in the wall that can make him any food he asks for. Why would a little kid need to eat the fruit of a random plant instead of just asking the magic food hole for a goddamn cheeseburger? And finally, if the kid is that much of a dipshit that he crams the first thing he finds hanging off a tree into his face and winds up full of parasites, how is that his brother's fault? I'm not saying the prank Jake pulls on Willie is cool. It's messed up, and he should feel bad about it. <laughs> but this first scene has Riker leaning on Willie like he told his doofus little brother to go eat the poison fruit, and that ain't the deal. We also learn in this opening scene that Jake and Willie are on the ship by themselves since their parents went on sabbatical. Their parents went on sabbatical and left their kids on the ship. Not sure who got the better half of that. The parents or the kids, but that's neither here nor there. The point is... What am I supposed to be talking about? Uh, Data. Data comes in to escort Jake to the quarantine room so he can get guilt-tripped by Dr. Crusher and his shithead little brother, but in the turbo lift, Data suddenly clams up mid-sentence and starts giving Jake the silent treatment. Data redirects the turbo lift to the bridge and gets off there, leaving Jake alone in the car. Now's your chance, Jake! Make a run for it! Take the lift to the shuttle bay and make a run for it while everyone's distracted! Your brother's gonna croak and they're gonna try to pin it on you! You gotta catch the Hoof Express, kid! Anyway, Data walks to his station on the bridge. He's obviously acting oddly, not acknowledging any of his fellow officers, and within moments of him sitting down at his control console, shit starts breaking down all over. The computer announces that life support is about to fail, so they've all gotta evacuate the bridge, so they all rush to the turbo lifts, but Data fakes them out, waits for the doors to shut on the other turbo lifts, then steps off, and he's alone on the bridge. While the rest of the team regroups in main engineering and tries to figure out what's going on, Data takes control of the ship, cuts off external communications, and locks out the computer from everyone but himself. He takes the Enterprise to this planet, Terlina 3, and sets up a series of force fields so he can move from the bridge to the transporter room without security grabbing him, because by this point, the others have figured out that Data's gone rogue. Meanwhile, Jake's been apprehended by Counselor Troy and brought to the quarantine room. I guess it's hard to steal a shuttle and get off the ship when you're locked out of the computer. Ah, well. Nice try, Jake, but I guess it's not your day. Troy tries to get Jake to apologize to Willie, but Willie just rolls over and Crusher and Troy look at each other like, eh, what are you going to do? Better not leave any medical tools in the bubble with him, Beverly, or you'll be picking him out of his stool tomorrow. Just saying. Anyway, Data makes it to a transporter room and beams down to the planet, and who does he meet there but his father, Dr. Noonien Sung? Dr. Sung had been presumed dead after the crystalline entity destroyed the Omicron Theta colony where Data was created, but it turns out Sung escaped, and he activated a built-in homing device to bring Data here. 
While Sung and Data are catching up, we discover the homing device didn't just bring Data home, because in walks Data's evil twin, Lore. Oh yeah, that's actually the most important thing we learn in the aforementioned first season episode, Data Lore, that Data has an evil twin, who does have emotions, and indomitable ambition, and who tries to murder everybody whenever he shows up. So Dr. Sung is like, oh, hey, Lore. Data's like, you shouldn't trust him because he's always trying to murder everybody. Sung waves that off like, ah, whatever. Lore's not so bad. He just reacts badly when people treat him unfairly. And now I have something very special to give to you, Data, my beloved and most favored son. Sung has a chip to give Data, an emotion chip. Lore sees that, and he's like, oh, hey, how about that? Good for you, Data. I'm so happy for you. Sung explains that the procedure to install the chip is really easy, and it'll just take a second, but first, he needs to go into the other room and take a nap so Laura can bum-rush Data and knock him out and switch places with him, which is exactly what happens during the next cutaway, and we come back to Sung installing the emotion chip, and Lore stands up like, surprise! It's me, the evil one! Now with twice the emotions, I guess? Lore kicks the shit out of Sung for a minute, then beams away right before Riker and Worf and Geordi get there, because by this point, the rest of the crew has at least regained enough control of the ship to come down and get Data. Riker wakes up Data, who was deactivated by Lore, and Data doesn't remember any of the Manchurian candidate shit he did to hijack the ship earlier. Data has a final scene with Sung, who is about to die, and then we're back on the ship to wrap things up with Jake and Willie, who is still in quarantine but is gonna be just fine. Data and Picard and Crusher watch the kids playing with some toy dinosaurs that Data brought back from Sung's place. I'm glad somebody's keeping an eye on Willie. Just make sure you count those toys when you get them back. Make sure you're not missing one. Hopefully they're made of non-toxic materials, though they did belong to Sung, so who the hell knows. Anyway, Data's like, hey, Jake and Willie are getting along. And Dr. Crusher's like, sure they are. They're brothers. Brothers forgive. And so does Starfleet, apparently, because Data returns from the whole suddenly falls into an impenetrable trance and takes over the ship episode and goes right back to work like nothing happened. But I mean, come on, is that so unreasonable? It wasn't Data's fault. It wasn't even a malfunction. It was his long-lost father activating a homing program. And now his long-lost father is dead. So Data going haywire and endangering the entire crew is going to turn out to be a one-time thing, I'm sure. It'll never, ever happen again until the two-parter that bridges the show's sixth and seventh seasons, Descent. Descent marks the return and the team-up of two of TNG's most memorable villains, Lore and the Borg. At the end of part one, Data, who has been feeling inexplicable rushes of emotion, leaves the ship with a Borg prisoner. The crew beam down to a nearby planet to conduct a search, and Picard, Troy, and Geordi are captured by a group of Borg who are disconnected from the Collective and now being led by Lore, dressed in a half-finished Black Adam cosplay, and Data, who has turned heel and joined forces with his evil twin. It turns out Lore has lured Data to the dark side by disabling his ethical program and feeding him emotions from the chip he pinched from Sung a few years ago. Fortunately, the heroes are able to turn Data's ethical program back on before he does anything worse than torture Jordy a little, and with some help from Hugh, they defeat Lore and leave this colony of confused and exploited Borg to fend for themselves in classic Star Trek fashion. And just like brothers, Data betrays his crew, endangers lives, stops short of doing anything too terrible, gets his head right, and goes back to work. <laughs> no harm done. All's well that ends well, right? Another isolated incident, special circumstances, no chance it will ever happen again until like a month later in the episode Phantasms. Yes, it's the one where Data almost stabs Troy to death in an elevator, only it turns out he was sleepwalking and he stabbed her in the shoulder because that's where something wacky was happening to her in this dream he had. Good thing he didn't get on the elevator with Riker, I guess, huh? Data's been running a dream program he discovered last year during a crossover episode with Dr. Bashir from Deep Space Nine, and he's just had his first nightmare. In the dream, he encounters a group of old-timey miners chipping away at a hole in the corridor. He tries to tell them to knock it off, but a high-pitched tone comes out of his mouth, and the miners overpower him and pull his head off. 
Later, Data tells Jordy that it was the strangest and most disturbing imagery he's ever experienced. Well, when someone from the bourgeoisie has an unexpected encounter with members of the working class in an unprotected environment, it can be startling, even upsetting, but honestly, Data, don't you think you're overreacting a little? They're just simple laborers. They're not going to hurt you. Except for the head-ripping off bit. The Enterprise has just been fitted with a new warp core, but it doesn't seem to be working so well. Every time they try to fire it up, the ship doesn't move. Did they install the Millennium Falcon's hyperdrive by accident? While Geordi tries to figure out what's wrong, Data keeps having nightmares. There's this one that takes place in 10 Forward, where Worf is enjoying the hell out of some cake, and Dr. Crusher is sucking Riker's brain through a straw. <laughs> Reminds me of a dream I had about Dr. Crusher back in the day. Only it wasn't my brain she was sucking. You know what I'm saying? It was this friend of mine's brain. But she wasn't sucking it through no straw on the side of his head, I'll tell you that much. The straw was coming straight out the top of his head, actually. But the really wild part is the straw was shaped like a dick. Dick Giordano, specifically. I think he was inking some of the Nightfall stuff for DC that year. Anyway, yeah, it was a pretty hot dream. Data keeps having nightmares, and they're really freaking him out. As freaked out as an android without emotions can get, anyway. So he seeks guidance from a recreation of Sigmund Freud on the holodeck. Freud listens to Data's story and says, My diagnosis is you want to fuck your mom and your dick don't get hard. Data's like, but my mom won't be retconned in for a few more episodes, and my dick is like a lead pipe 24-7, so that doesn't sound right. So he goes to talk to Counselor Troy, and she's like, maybe you should stop obsessing over your own dreams, you neurotic weirdo. Also, you went to see a hologram of a 19th century psychiatrist whose theories had been mostly discredited for decades by the time this episode was written, never mind the time at which it takes place? What's up with that? I know I'm a lousy therapist, and the audience knows I'm a lousy therapist, but none of you other assholes on the ship are supposed to be wise to it, so what's up, Data? Are you going to get with the program, or are we going to have a problem? Data's like, chill, chill, we're cool, we're cool. And the next time he sees her, he stabs her in the elevator. And I'm not saying I condone it. But I get it. It turns out Data's nightmares are the result of these scary invisible bugs that are infesting the crew. Somehow, Data is detecting these creatures unconsciously, and this unconscious awareness is being processed through his dream program. So, in order to figure out how to get rid of them, Data runs his dream program again, this time with a hookup to the holodeck. This enables Picard and Geordi to enter Data's subconscious and explore the dream like an actual physical location. And somewhere in London, a young Christopher Nolan turned from the TV screen in his university dorm room to scribble something down. That something. Must have been his turn to pick up supper. How do I have this? They figure out that the murderous proletarians represent the gross invisible bugs, and that they can be killed by a high-frequency interphasic pulse, represented in Data's dream by that high-pitched sound Data made. Once the bug infestation has been eliminated, Geordi speculates that they must have been hiding aboard a component of the new warp core that was manufactured on the planet Thanatos 7. <laughs> Thanatos 7? Starfleet buys warp cores that are made someplace with a name that literally means death? Damn, you Federation types just do not give a shit, do you? By the way, I know not all of Brannon Braga's contributions to Star Trek have been positive, but he wrote this episode, and I'd love to shake his hand if for no other reason than establishing that Starfleet uses warp cores manufactured on planet Death. Those aren't the only examples of Data's programming causing him to act in a way that endangers or could potentially endanger other people. This is an essay, not a comprehensive list, but I think they're enough to get my point across. Data's programming is vulnerable to being disrupted or manipulated by outside forces, and when that happens, because Data is so smart and fast and strong and generally capable, he becomes a really serious threat to the Enterprise and to the lives of everyone on it. In the wrong circumstances, Data is extremely dangerous. Is he too dangerous to be in Starfleet? 
let's think about this the way data would rationally, divorced from emotion. And since most of us are pretty attached to data, let's make it easier by taking data out of the equation and considering the question with another character in a different but analogous situation. Let's consider what might happen if, in another fictional universe, James Bucky Barnes, the Winter Soldier, joined the Avengers. I know, that actually happened in the comics. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a different hypothetical situation that I'm making up and describing to you right now. So, here's how it goes. Bucky proves his worth as a hero, helps to save the world once or twice, and so the Avengers decide to reward him and strengthen their own ranks by giving him a spot on the team. Bucky is no longer an agent of Hydra. He's a good guy, and that's all he wants to be, but he still has the psychological conditioning Hydra brainwashed into him. He and his allies think he got rid of all of that stuff, but it turns out they were wrong. And one time during a crucial Avengers mission, a Hydra agent hacks into Bucky's headset and says some magic words, and Bucky goes into assassin mode and tries to kill, I don't know, the Prime Minister of New Zealand. She's pretty good, right? As far as world leaders go? The other Avengers foil the assassination attempt and break through the Hydra programming. Bucky comes back to his senses. He hasn't actually killed anybody, and nothing that happened was his fault. So, the other Avengers decide to let it go and allow Bucky to remain a trusted member of the team. Fair enough, right? But let's say a couple of years later, it happens again. Maybe S.H.I.E.L.D. uncovers a secret Hydra base miles beneath the streets of, oh, let's say, Branson, Missouri. Nobody's that surprised. And the Avengers get called in to help, and Bucky finds the diary of some old Hydra mind control expert, and one of the phrases written in it triggers another bit of Winter Soldier conditioning no one knew was there, and Bucky does some more involuntary Hydra ship. Maybe the Red Skull is dead, and Bucky works some warlock mojo and resurrects him. But once again, the Avengers are able to pull Bucky back from the dark side, and he helps the team stop Red Skull from, I don't know, taking over the world or whatever he wants to do. And once again, it's all good. The rest of the team doesn't hold it against Bucky, and why should they? He didn't do anything too bad, and it's only happened twice since he joined the team. No problem. Then a couple of weeks later, it happens again. Bucky's in the kitchen making a cup of hot chocolate, and he overhears Iron Man telling Hawkeye a joke that includes a phrase that somehow, randomly, incredibly, triggers yet another bit of Winter Soldier programming that compels Bucky to steal a Quinjet and attempt to crash it into the Washington Monument or something. Once again... It all works out fine. Once again, no one is hurt. Once again, Bucky is himself again when everything is over. But the question must be asked, mustn't it? How many times does this have to happen before the rest of the team asks Bucky for his keys to the mansion? It's nothing personal. Bucky's a good dude and most of the time is a major asset, but he just so happens to have this thing about himself that's difficult to understand and perhaps impossible to fully get rid of that makes him, through no fault of his own, an unpredictable danger to the rest of the team. At some point, doesn't cutting him become the responsible thing? And if that's true of Bucky in my ad hoc Avengers example, isn't it true of Data too? Maybe, but maybe not. True, we're shown in multiple episodes of TNG that Data is a potential danger to the ship, but we're also shown in a much greater number of episodes that Data is uniquely capable of saving the ship. Three years pass between Brothers, my first example of Data's programming causing him to behave in a way that threatens the ship, and Descent, my second example. During those three years, we get the episode Hero Worship, where Data realizes with seconds to spare that the solution to the crisis that is threatening the ship is to drop the shields. Nobody else was going to think of it. And if Data hadn't been there, it's reasonable to assume the Enterprise would have been destroyed. And if that's not enough, another episode that occurs during that three-year interval is one of my favorites, Cause and Effect, which is where the Enterprise gets caught in a time loop. 
Data's presence is essential to the ship escaping the loop. His positronic brain makes it possible to send a message from one round of the loop to the next. He sends the message, and at the end of the next loop, he recognizes and correctly interprets the message just in time to avert disaster and break the Enterprise and Fraser's ship free from the loop. Those are the two episodes from that three-year period I can think of where Data clearly saves the ship in a way that another crew member wouldn't or couldn't have. There are other, less clear-cut examples from those years, too. Early in Season 5, there's the episode Disaster where Data uses his body to disrupt the arc of electricity blocking the way through the Jeffries tube, enabling Riker to pop off Data's head and make it to main engineering to regain control of the ship, which he does by plugging Data's severed head into the computer. Data is also crucial to the Times Arrow two-parter that bridges seasons five and six. His positronic brain allows the crew to travel back in time to stop the Davidians from killing people in 19th century San Francisco. That wasn't really a threat to the ship, but lives were saved, and Picard was able to complete the time loop that allowed him to encounter Guinan for the first time, from her perspective anyway, and he got to meet Mark Twain too. Thanks, Data. None of that would have happened if Data had been kicked out of Starfleet for being too much of a risk after Brothers. So, obviously, in hindsight, kicking Data off the ship would have been a mistake, especially when viewed by us from a real-world perspective. But even in-universe, in the immediate aftermath of incidents of Data going apeshit and hijacking the ship or attacking people, it's understandable why Captain Picard or some other authority figure wouldn't have reacted by throwing Data off the ship. Because the thing is, yeah, Data can be manipulated and compelled to act in dangerous ways, but that's no less true of anyone else on the ship. In the real world, an artificial intelligence with a programmed personality might be far more vulnerable to that sort of third-party control than a flesh-and-blood person because that kind of extreme psychological conditioning, brainwashing, doesn't really exist. It's the stuff of popular fiction. But Star Trek, being popular fiction, operates under different rules. In Star Trek, pretty much anybody is vulnerable to being mind-controlled. In the first season's Conspiracy, a species of intelligent parasites infect and control enough senior officers to almost take control of Starfleet until Picard and Riker get wise to the scheme and blow up the head parasite. Geordi is brainwashed into a sleeper agent in the episode The Mind's Eye and almost assassinates a Klingon governor. In the game, aliens use an addictive game to control the crew of the Enterprise. Only Wesley and Robin Leffler manage to avoid falling victim to the plot. Until the end of the episode, when they're about to be turned, only to be saved at the last moment by Data, who is immune to the mind-controlling effect of the game and has spent most of the episode deactivated. Hey, this was after... Brothers, and before Descent, should we add this to the list of times the rest of the crew was lucky Data was there? I think so. There's also Allegiance from Season 3, where Picard is abducted and replaced by an exact duplicate who orders the ship to move perilously close to a pulsar. Conundrum from Season 5, where aliens wipe the memories of the entire crew and almost succeed in tricking them into using the Enterprise to attack an enemy species. and. Power Play, also from Season 5, in fact, from the week after Conundrum, where Troy and O'Brien, in addition to Data, are possessed by the disembodied consciousnesses of criminals who take hostages in 10 Forward as part of a plot to stage a cosmic jailbreak. In other words, it's Star Trek, and in Star Trek, Star Trek shit happens, which means not just Data, but anybody is vulnerable to being mind-controlled or manipulated into endangering the ship, which means if Data is too dangerous for Starfleet, so is everybody else. To return to Star Trek Picard for a minute, and this isn't going to be a spoiler, I'm talking about stuff from the first episode that was also discussed in the promotional materials, one of the key incidents of that first season is the Federation banning androids after a group of androids carry out a deadly attack on Mars. Those androids are compromised and manipulated in ways similar to incidents involving data on TNG. And the creators of Star Trek Picard obviously 
want us to regard that banishment of androids as a mistake, an overreaction that violates the Federation's most cherished values. It's true that being an android gives Data certain vulnerabilities that can and have been exploited, causing him to act in dangerous ways, but while Data is the only android on the ship and therefore the only person with those specific vulnerabilities, he's not the only person on the Enterprise with the potential to threaten the ship or the lives of the crew. It's only reasonable to ask if Data specifically is too dangerous if you regard Data as inherently more dangerous than the others. And in this context, despite his special abilities, I don't think that's warranted. Plus, it kind of goes against the whole point of Star Trek, diversity being our strength and all that. As Star Trek The Next Generation demonstrates over and over again, the crew of the Enterprise, and Starfleet in general, gains a lot more than it risks losing by having Data around. Besides, if Data wasn't on the show, who'd be the breakout character? You know what? That might have worked. I can see Barkley taking Data's place on the show. And on the ship, too. We know he's good with computers. Hey folks, I hope you enjoyed this one. I'm going to let you know what the subject of the next Trek Actually video is going to be. But first, I want to give shout outs to some of my newest Patreon patrons and channel members. First, the new patrons. They are Timbo Mullaney. Thank you, Timbo. Zelma Nixon. Thank you, Zelma. Marcus Jones. Thank you, Marcus. Chris B. Cakes. Thank you, Chris. Bruce Bardup. Thank you, Bruce. Russell Davison, thank you, Russell. Dan Decker, thank you, Dan. John Brewer, thank you, John. Ian Z, thank you, Ian. Yua Chazinska, thank you, Yua. Dog Girl Kari, thank you, Dog Girl Kari. Glenn Helwig, thank you, Glenn. Austin Laplante, thank you, Austin. Keith Brings, thank you, Keith. Steely Dan Rather, thank you, Steely Dan Rather. Jason Odom, thank you, Jason. And Sebastian Rettig. Thank you, Sebastian. Next up, new channel members. And they are Some Random Geek, who is now both a patron and a member. Thanks, Geek. Stephen G. Clenard, also now both a patron and a member. Thanks, Stephen. Harry Pothead. Thank you, Harry. Jules. Thank you, Jules. Zelma Nixon. Thank you, Zelma. A new patron and a new member. Kirok2011, another patron and member. That's not necessary, but I definitely appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Kirok2011. Snowflake990, thank you, Snowflake990. And Sean Collins, thank you, Sean. Those are the newest patrons to pledge $5 a month or more, and the newest channel members to join at the $4.99 tier or higher. If you want to support this channel, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash steveshives and pledging any amount from a dollar a month on up, or clicking the join button to become a member of this channel at one of the three tiers I have available. All patrons and members get access to exclusive posts that allow you to vote in the polls that determine upcoming Trek Actually topics, and also submit questions ahead of time for my twice-monthly Ask Away live streams. If you pledge $5 a month or more on Patreon, or become a member at the $4.99 tier or higher, you get a shout out at the end of a Trek Actually video. I could not do this without the support of my patrons and my members. So to all of you who support this channel with a monthly contribution, thank you so much for enabling me to have this wonderful job. And once again, if you want to help out, please go to patreon.com slash Steve Shives or just click the join button below the video. Many thanks. If you like what I do on YouTube, especially the Star Trek-related stuff, you should also check out my side projects, The Ensign's Log, the Star Trek-themed comedy podcast that I'm on alongside Jason Harding and Dana Cole. The three of us play characters who are low-ranking Starfleet officers. We just started our fourth season, where Jason's and my characters have recently experienced a time jump that took us from the TOS era to the TNG era, where we find ourselves serving aboard the Enterprise D during TNG's first season. Our show is 
a lot of fun to make. And judging by some of the comments we get, it's a lot of fun to listen to as well. If you're not listening, the links are in the description of this video. Please do check out the Ensign's Log. I think you will really dig it. I also do a weekly watch-along live stream with Dana called Trek Reluctantly, where we watch episodes of Deep Space Nine, which Dana has never seen before, and Firefly, which I have never seen before. And we're almost finished with Firefly, and we will be watching something else that I've never seen instead of Firefly once that's over, but we're not quite there yet. So we invite you to queue up whichever episode we're watching on your end and watch along with us. It's every Wednesday starting at 6 p.m. Eastern on this channel right here. So if you're interested and able, please join us for Trek Reluctantly. We'd love to have you. Now, let's talk about the next episode of this series. This is gonna be a fun one. It was another first time topic that captured the imagination of the patrons and members and swept through and won the poll. It was a nail biter. It won the poll by a single vote and I'm so glad it did, because it's a topic that allows me to survey a broad cross-section of the Star Trek franchise, but also to zero in on some of the most delightfully odd concepts from the original series, namely the many duplicate Earths encountered by the crew of the Enterprise. The question around which we will focus our discussion is, what is actually Star Trek's worst parallel Earth? Like I said, should be fun. Look for that one next month, and also look for a special video next week where I talk about some of the most popular and interesting couples that Star Trek fans have shipped together over the years. We're gonna talk about Star Trek ships, but not starships, relationships. See you soon for that one. Thanks for watching. Take care, everybody.